Welcome to the Living Legacy Podcast, where we feature wealth experts, investors, and entrepreneurs as they share their inspiring journey to living their best life. Now, let's get started with the show. Hello there, Brian Fouts here, host of the Living Legacy Podcast, where I feature top leaders across many industries. Now, today, I have Dush Ramachandran from the Net Momentum Corporation. Now, Dush, he advises entrepreneurs who are looking to buy, sell, or grow their companies. Now, this podcast is brought to you by Money Ripples. Now, Chris and his team over at Money Ripples, they help people get their money working for them. And if they learn more, go to moneyripples.com. All right. So, Dush, I want to say thank you for being here. Um, this is going to be a fun episode. So, thanks for being here. Thank you, Brian. It's always a pleasure. <clears throat> now, to get rolling, I, I know your background. I, I know your story. It's pretty incredible what you've done and where you're at right now today. But for those of us on the call who may not know where you came from and some of your background, can you give us a quick uh, kind of synopsis of how you got to where you're at today, but really that beginning where you, uh, well, I'll let you share it. Sure. Sounds good. Yeah. So, uh, Brian, I uh, grew up entirely in the enterprise software industry um, and uh, from being a sales guy with carrying a bag, pounding the streets, uh, selling software uh, to I grew to head up sales for a Fortune 500 software company uh, called Computer Vision. Um, and so then I saw an opportunity to buy the Canadian division of that company and take it private. So I took the, it's a $200 million division of the company, uh, took it private, ran there for several years and sold it, then started another enterprise software company in the uh, manufacturing space and uh, from, from scratch and grew that. And in the very first few years of that business, we had such blue chip customers as Rolls Royce, Boeing, Ingersoll Rand, Polaroid, et cetera. And uh, grew that company and sold it. The company that bought my business had a lot of venture investment, but not a lot of revenue. So they saw what we had done with uh, the, the resources we had, which was not very much. Um, and they said, hey, would you come over and help us run and grow our company um, and, and eventually, if possible, sell it? So this rarely ever happens when, you know, companies buy other companies, they don't take on the management of the, the acquired company and have them come in and run their own business. But in my case, they, they invited me to do that. So I did. So went in, became uh, VP of global sales of that company, grew that company, sold it. And then uh, I was invited by the board at ClickBank. You might be familiar with ClickBank. It's the largest affiliate network in the world also the largest retailer of digitally downloadable products. And so I was invited by the board at ClickBank to come uh, grow and sell their company. And uh, when I got to ClickBank, it was a modest sized company, about $95 million in revenue. And over the next six years, I grew that to over $550 million, almost half a billion dollars in revenue and didn't manage to sell it. But um, at that point, then I decided I was going to, go off and do something on my own. And so I left ClickBank to start a digital agency called the Net Momentum, along with my wife. Um, and uh, so one of my passions has always been um, seeing how different industries grow and how they, how they uh, create growth strategies in different, different ways. And there's so many different levers that you can use for growth. And so that fascinated me. And so through, through this uh, business that I now run, I've had the incredible pleasure of helping a lot of companies grow, um, helping entrepreneurs decide, you know, which companies to buy, helping them buy companies, helping them to sell their companies and grow them. In fact, uh, Brian, as you know, I'm working with uh, one of our common clients mm -hmm. um, that's doing exactly that. So that's kind of a little bit of my background. So um, this is a passion of mine. Love to chat about growing companies, selling companies, buying companies, et cetera. So that's, that's a lot of fun. I mean, you might think that's kind of crazy, but in my world, in my world that's, a, that's a fun topic for me. Well, it's interesting you said that because one of the challenges for a lot of businesses that you know, are business owners I've come across is they have a business and they think, I own this business. I'm a business owner. And yet they're stuck because they yeah. most likely have a job. They don't really have a true business. And 
or maybe they have a true business, but they're not really acting as a business owner. They're acting as an employee in their business. And how, do you come across that quite often? Yeah, absolutely. You know, a classic example of that is where people go and buy like a Subway franchise. That is the surest way to buy yourself a job and a very stressful, very long working hour kind of job. Because you know, you have all the challenges of you know a job where you're working long hours with not a lot of money and you also have all the stressors of owning a business you have to have purchase orders put out for supplies and whether customers come in or not the supplies are going to come in you got to pay for them and you know you have to market your small business and there is a subway store just around the corner there's you know other places where people can go eat so there's a lot of challenges so uh, that's an extreme example. But to your point, Brian, uh, a lot of entrepreneurs and a lot of business owners um, miss out on the opportunity to kind of zoom out a little bit and look at their business from a little bit of a vantage point and say, OK, what's happening here? What are the best ways I can grow? Because too often they're in there fighting the fires. They're battling day to day issues, you know supplier challenges, you know, uh, customers not coming in or customers uh, discounting products and, you know, competition, all of these different things that every business owner faces, they allow that to kind of become their world. And so they're not able to zoom out and look at the bigger picture. So one of the things that I find very helpful is um, taking taking a moment to kind of snap them out of the um, sort of the, the close focus, moving up to maybe 10,000 feet and looking at the business from that perspective and saying, okay, now what do we see here? And you'd be amazed at the kind of insights that that come up. And it's it's really fascinating how you can chart a course from that point on. Yeah, it's interesting. A lot of, and, I, and obviously one of the clients that you referred to is one when I first met this individual, there was a question I asked him very specifically up front, and it was, what do you do? Right. And he said, I am X. Yeah. And so in this, ca this case, he was, you know, say, he's a dentist. I'm a dentist. I'm like, okay. So fast forward over some more weeks, we worked together and said, what do you do? I'm a dentist. Okay. At this point, though, I realized he, he owned the building and, and practice he was in. Yeah. So I essentially did kind of what you, at, what you said is we pulled him to the 10,000 foot level and right. you know, you're not a dentist, you're a business owner. Right. And I said, and so the change for him started in his, in his mind, in his mind, yep. he had this, cause he, I said, if you're a dentist, then you have a job. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And the other thing that, uh, that helps uh, business owners look at their business as a business um, is when you look at where's the money coming from, right? Mm -hmm. Where's the revenue coming from? And you would look at, okay, you know, if you're a, if, I'll take another example. You're a truck rental company, right? Mm -hmm. You say the money is coming from renting trucks. Okay, that's fine. But what's behind that? Well, people need to move or, you know, it's like a U-Haul franchise. Maybe um, people need to move, so they're in trucks. Okay. Or people have, you know, even, even FedEx rents trucks from us. Okay. Why is that? Well their trucks are under repair or they have a sudden surge in demand. They don't have enough trucks and they rent. So essentially, now you look at it, you're helping people move things from one place to another, whether they're doing it themselves, doing it for someone else, whatever. Yeah, that's about right. Okay. Now, what else could be associated with that process that you could add to this business? How could you look at this business as, you know, if, if helping people move things is, is the challenge, trucks is one part of the solution. What else could be? And then now you look at, oh, yeah, that's, there's absolutely a whole lot of things, you know, like packing material, shipping uh, labels, uh, packing tape, things of that nature, hand trucks. All of these things are part of the process. So how could, how could that come into the revenue picture? What are you doing about that? Not a lot. We just rent their trucks. Okay, would it make sense for you to add all those things to the business? Yeah, absolutely it would, because, you know, let's do some back of the back of the envelope numbers and you start to figure out there's a lot of hidden, 
you know, revenue in all of these different pockets that you can be leveraging. Now you're looking at this saying, okay, what are the other truck rental places that I could go buy and bring into this business and operate them in the same way I'm operating this? Now I've, I've zoomed up about maybe you place a manager responsible for this business, put another manager in response, responsible for that. Pretty soon now you've got an operation that is wider. Now you have economies of scale, right? There's a lot of other things you could do. So it's, it's, it's that kind of an idea, you know, where you can start to look at businesses that way. And yeah. one of the things that you mentioned earlier, uh, Brian, which is also very interesting is, and by doing that, you've made yourself incredibly appealing to anybody that wants to buy a business that's already set up. You've got the processes in place. They don't have to think about it. They don't have to reinvent it. You've got it in place. And so you're a place that provides this type of service and across a wide range, now you're very, very attractive. And it's an interesting you mentioned that because that piqued a, a memory of mine. Years ago, when I was looking at buying a couple of businesses, I had a few that I was looking at. And one was a laundromat, like, a, but it wasn't a, a one for, uh, it was a commercial laundromat. So sure. hotels, big buildings, things like that. And it was a very lucrative business because they had a huge market share in the area. The owner worked about 80 hours a week. Wow. And I, I when I saw the, the books and the numbers, I was like, okay, this is all nice and you know fine, but oh my gosh, that she that person was the driver of the revenue. Sure. Without that person, the business did not run or exist. And so I made it I determined that if I buy this business, I'm buying a very, very uh successful job. job. And I'm like, it's successful it's a job. And to replace that position. It, it didn't destroy the numbers, but it made them not attractive at all. Right. And so right. that's what I've seen a lot is a lot of people, they, they have a job, they call it a business, but, they, but they're stuck in it. Because if they stop doing what they're doing, the business falls apart, which is active income, which is fine. Right. But when you're looking at it to scale or grow a business, you've got to be very aware, from my perspective, of that aspect of the business. Is it a job? Is it a business? Right. Um, so yeah, to, to, let's think about this for a second. So... Looking at a restaurant as an example, mm -hmm. I see I go to a lot of restaurants in my area, and you can tell pretty quickly that the um, the owners are um, a couple. They're right. usually a husband and wife, and then so oftentimes you'll see like the daughter or a son at the register, right? And they think they're a business owner. Now that's fine; it is a business, but how would that business be looked at from somebody who's wanting to acquire or buy it? Right. So now, <clears throat> in those types of situations, the big challenge is that if you buy out the previous owner, the rest of his family is not going to stick around and work for you, right? right. In all probability. Yeah. So now you've got to find other people to replace all of the people that just walked out with the previous owner. This is one of the big challenges where business owners don't think about uh, a succession plan, right? Who is, who is going to run this business? And they frequently think about their children. You know, what I'd love to do is to hand over my business to my son or my daughter. I'd like them to follow in my business, which is fine. There's nothing wrong with that. However, you've got to make the business not so dependent, exactly as you said, Brian, not so dependent on one personality or one individual that absent that individual, the business collapses, right? Mm -hmm. So the way to do that is through succession planning, where you grow people within the company who can eventually take over. And maybe, not, and people, people today are a lot more impatient about acquiring responsibility than perhaps they were 20 years ago, 30 years ago. Right. 30 years ago, if you told someone, you know, you work here for 15 years, eventually you'll be made a manager, they'd probably be happy about that. Today, you know, things are moving a lot faster and people can jump jobs and, you know, grow higher in organizations, acquire more responsibility. So you've got to be able to or willing to bring people into positions of responsibility in a three to five year time frame. From, you know, provided, of course, that they show promise, that they're trustworthy, they've, they've you know, you, you have a good sense of their ethics and so on, then yeah, and it, it's, it's a shorter time frame than it used to be. And that's great. Groom those people. Now you 
basic idea is you work yourself out of a job. That's what you got to do. Work yourself out of a job. Make sure that the people that, you, that are coming in after you can assume that responsibility, can run the business. Now you can devote yourself to either buying other businesses or if you want to sell this business and retire or, or you know, take up golf or racing Porsches or whatever else you want to do, you could do that. I love that. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, so that, those are very good points to make, especially when you're looking at, uh, you know, your own business. Now, what are some ways, because obviously if you have a business right now, succession planning is a very big part of that, but a big part of succession planning also can be growing the value of that business. Exactly. So what are some of the ways, so if, if a business owner is listening to this and saying, okay, this is awesome stuff. I want to do succession. I want to start to replace myself in my job, right? So I can own the business and operate it. <laughs> So the second phase of that almost is, okay, now that you're starting to do that, now it's about how do you grow and increase the value of that business? Yeah. What are some ways that uh, a business owner should look at that? Great question. So the, the, the greatest way in which you can increase the value of a business is by being able to demonstrate that the business can run without you. So what does that mean? Because every prospective buyer that is looking at buying your business is thinking the same thing, which is once I buy this business, how am I going to run it? Right. Because I don't have the years of experience that the previous owner had. I'm coming into this business. Maybe I have, you know, a business that is adjacent to this, somewhat similar, but maybe, maybe exactly the same. But in this particular company, in this particular business, I don't know the intricacies of all of the individuals, their customers, all of those sorts of things. So how can I expect that the company will continue or the business will continue to grow in the way that has grown so far? And so the best way to demonstrate that is to build processes. So that sounds kind of boring, but what are these processes? For example, a solid accounting system where you have uh, probably a bookkeeper or an accountant that actually keep the books, manage payroll, so you're not doing it yourself. So you've got somebody that is that you can go to and say, okay, this person has the books. And at any given time, you can ask them, and how much did we sell last month? What were our costs last month? <clears throat> and what is our expense expected to be in the next six months? And they'll give you the answer because they've been doing it. So, so that's one set of processes. How do you, how are you planning for growth? Where is the growth coming from? So what processes do you have to bring in more customers tomorrow than you did today, right? So what are the growth processes you've got in place? How are you going to cope with that growth? How are you going to deliver the products and services to those new customers when they come in? So now again, who, who's heading up sales? Who is responsible for revenue? Somebody needs to be on the hook to deliver revenue. So if you're projecting that you're going to do a million dollars, two million dollars, ten million dollars, $100 million, doesn't matter, right? The exact number doesn't matter, but somebody needs to be responsible for delivering that. And in most businesses, it's the business owner who's responsible for delivering the revenue. So what happens? Because he's got the relationship with the customers, the large customers, you know, they know him, they're used to him, they trust him. Now, if he's gone, will they continue to buy? Don't know. So these are all the questions that you need to sort of, uh, answer and these are the the doubts and suspicions in the minds of the prospective buyers you need to allay you need to make them comfortable that you could step out tomorrow and take a vacation for six months and the business would continue without us without skipping a beat right that proves that it's a sustainable business over time that increases the value of the business enormously you could have a big book of business and projections, you know, for huge growth, but that doesn't matter as much. That doesn't do as much to your value as having systems, processes, and people in place. And that makes sense because those things are invaluable. And I've looked at a lot of businesses for sale, and a lot of them don't have those things in place because yep. oftentimes the owner is doing all of them. Exactly. Exactly. So, I mean, I've come across a client that not doing this now, but they had a, a little over $30 million revenue business per year. Mm -hmm. their own books, their own payroll. Uh, no, they hadn't, they hadn't restructured their entities in, in over a couple decades. And 
they were stressed out and they had a, a very um, time consuming job in their own business. And yet they were doing over 30 plus million dollars. Wow. Because they had no, and they have no processes. That's amazing. Yeah. And you know, the other thing that, that tends to happen is when the business owner is taking care of payroll, taking care of accounting, sales, and everything else, and they're kind of doing all of these different things, their general attitude is, well, I got it covered. I'm doing all of this. I grew this business all these many years. I can absolutely do it. That's not the point. The <laughs> point that they're missing is what happens when you're no longer there? You sell the company and go. Now what happens? The prospective owner, prospective buyer is thinking, man, I don't have any of those relationships. How am I going to manage? So the only thing that fixes that is the, the, the processes. The other, the other challenge is if the business owner has been conducting all of this by himself or herself, the institutional knowledge is, in, is locked in one person's brain. Right. Yeah. It needs to, the institutional knowledge needs to be institutionalized. It's got to be all through the company, all through the business. You if you're if you go on to the shipping dock or the receiving dock and ask the forklift operator, what happens when a new shipment comes in? What what do you do that is standard process? And he should be able to tell you. It's not like I check in with Joe, Joe being the owner. I check in with Joe and Joe says, put it over there, put it on that dock and move this to that. Then I go do that. Now that process is broken down. You can't replicate that. That's the problem. It's interesting you mentioned that because I actually, you, you triggered another memory in me. <laughs> I was looking at another business for sale one time because I came from construction. That was my background sure. for over a decade in construction, commercial. And uh, there was this business that we were looking at and it was a, an equipment rental business to, the, to construction companies and projects. And it was a very lucrative business. Mm -hmm. And it was a family run business. And so we were looking at it, doing the books, the numbers. There were some funky numbers because it was a family business. So there were expenses, things that probably would not normally be in there. But we ended up passing on that, on that one. Pretty hard pass, too, by the way. Because mm -hmm. that it was a family business. Right. Yes. The other thing that I, we noticed in the business is that it was a relationship business, meaning the head of the business, the owner, mm -hmm. he had all these relationships. Of course. He had no marketing person, no salesperson. None of that was in place. So he had no, what you actually process, like you talked about, yep. how to bring on new in, new uh, um, clients. Yep. So new revenue. It was all him. He was out there hitting the pavement, talking to people. And we did not want to buy that position. because it Absolutely. Made and so we passed on it. And we found out that nobody in the family wanted to take over the business either. Right. So they were kind of in a hard place because he was at a, of an age that he's like, I got to stop doing this. Right. And he's like, hey, as soon as he's, he's gone, we're gone. Yep. Well, then your business goes like this. The value just drops. Drops. It just plummets. Yeah. The, the, the thing, and, and buyers, like, like you saw, buyers are able to see that. Yeah. They, they do the math and they go, okay, now many of the key positions are held by family members, you know, the wife of the owner, the son of the owner, the daughter of the owner, the niece or nephew of the owner, et cetera. Yep. And chances are, you know, chances are, especially for the younger people, they've sort of set into bad habits because there's not a great deal of performance management. There's mm -hmm. not, there's no performance reviews. They just come in, do a job, and they get paid handsomely for it because they all want to keep it in the family. And even though the business is probably doing extremely well, um, when the new owner comes in, all of these people are not going to be around. Now you've got to fight incompetent people that are going to fill all these spots. Now suddenly you're looking at, you've just bought a shell, right? You really haven't bought a business. It's not a going concern. You've bought a shell. Now you've got to populate various people in various places within the company. That's, that, that's a real challenge. And what we looked at in that business was, is we, we started to evaluate the numbers. We said, okay, th their, their valuation is up here. Right. Our valuation is the assets of the business only. Exactly. And that's all we looked at. Hey, you got a lot of inventory, a lot of equipment. Uh, it's all paid off. There's some, you know, you know, accounts receivable. That's the value that we placed in the business. And it was, it, it was like a, 
10 times difference in what they wanted for the business. And there's, I was like, there's no so, so knowing yeah. that the show, here's a question for you. So if you're, a, sure. if you're looking to acquire a business, mm -hmm. what, what would you think about if you're, if, if you, if you have a system, if you have done kind of what you talked about and you, maybe you've gone through your own mm -hmm. business, you've uh, made some processes that really help you remove yourself from the business. Would an opportunity to go look at, especially in these current economic times we're in right now, mm -hmm to find a business that is not operating at that level, yep. that, is, that is being operated by the owner, that mm -hmm. you can come in and apply your processes to after you've acquired it. And Absolutely. It. So is that, Absolutely. is that what you recommend? Yeah, that, now that actually represents on the other side of the table, that represents an opportunity, right? right? So if you're the buyer and you've got a business that's well dialed in and you've got professional people in lots of, roles you've and it, it's not necessary that they should not be family members they can be family members by all means but if they're competent they're professional they're holding their job because of the fact that they are competent professional not because they're family members then that's great that's an incredibly powerful situation to be in now when you look at companies that may not be run that way when you look at businesses where you have no processes it's all kind of flying by the seat of the pants. Now you have an opportunity to significantly diminish the value of that purchase because of the lack of processes and so on. And then, you know, just as you described, Brian, you can put your processes in there and raise the productivity of their business and take it to where it's never been before, right? That's a huge opportunity. Um, the other thing to look at also is when you're looking to buy a business, um, always look at how much cash the business is throwing off, right? Mm -hmm. And where is the cash going? Often you will find that it's going to automobiles driven by the owner and his family. Mm -hmm. It is going to paying rent on vacation properties or paying mortgages on vacation properties. It's external to the business. Right. Because yeah. that's an easy way for business owners to kind of take money out of the business without attracting too much attention. Right. So, so the, all of those things represent great opportunities for you to bring that money into the business and grow the business. And now you're showing that the business has those assets in place and that increases the value of the business tremendously. One other thing I would suggest is when you're looking at a, and we'll, for, we'll call it a poorly run business in that sense, right? Where you, you have a lot of, you know, family members running the business and you have, you can see how you can increase the efficiency of that business dramatically by putting in your processes. One thing to consider is doing an asset purchase, just like you said, rather than buying the entire business, just buying the assets of the business. Right. Because if they've entered into debt or if they have other uh, issues that are attached to the business, you don't want any part of that. Because if it's business debt, if it's a revolving line of credit that you, or it's a bank loan to finance equipment or whatever, that's fine. That's part of the business. But if it's, you know, mortgage on vacation property that's being paid by the business or, you know, nice cars being paid for by the business, you don't want any part of that. So you just do an asset purchase and then you've got what counts as an asset on the balance sheet. That's what you're buying. And that'll be a whole lot cheaper than if you're buying the business as a whole. It's interesting. So um, uh, an acquaintance of mine was running an accounting business and he was looking to grow and scale. Well, guess what? He's limited. Uh, right. on how he could do that because of, you know, a lot of people want to, his business, they want to come in and meet with you, right? Right. And he wanted to do something a little bit different. So he started looking at acquiring other businesses because he had good processes that he wanted to apply to other businesses. And so he started finding owner operated accounting businesses because guess what? He didn't need the owner in the business. He just wanted right. the portfolio of clients. Sure. sure. So he started buying them for pennies on the dollar because one, it was a job that, that the owner had. Right. So they, wanted, they wanted to escape the job. And he's like, well, guess what? I'm just going to take your portfolio of clients, incorporate into my own business, and we don't need a physical office for you for them anymore. He right. did that five times, 
built his business up you know exponentially greater than it was before and then he got noticed by another larger company who then gobbled up his entire portfolio as well and so all of a sudden and it was less than two years he did this less than two years he went so, from single office you know or, or business to owning five that he incorporated and then a bigger one bought him out it makes so, a huge difference doesn't it yeah. so all the things you're talking about uh they came into play when he was doing this his processes buying right. businesses that complemented him but did not increase his his uh, you know his time in the business uh all these kind of things made it a very profitable uh, sale for him <laughs> and also yeah, for sure. acquiring company too, whom I, I know both the parties too. They yeah. were both very happy. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, um, the, the other thing I should mention is there are several reasons why a company might want to buy your business. Another business might want to buy your business, right? Uh, the first reason is to acquire customers. So you're, you've got customers in an area, they're, they're loyal to you, they know, like, and trust you. And what easier way to bring on those customers than buy your business, and, you know, fold that into their business, they've now acquired the customers. Second is to acquire technology. If you've developed some technology, you have some unique secret sauce, then the only way to acquire that is, yeah, you can license it, but then you, you know, you never own it. You're always paying for it. Instead, you go out and buy the company, take that technology and embed it in. Yep. The third is talent acquisition, right? Where you have, maybe it's the, it's the business owner himself who is extraordinarily talented, very smart. And this usually you find in high, um, you know, technology companies where you have the founder who is a technologist and has built this technology, maybe hasn't been able to take that business as far as he could because he's a technology person not a salesperson. And so therefore you might say, well, let me, let me acquire the business and take the technology and this individual who is a brilliant scientist or a brilliant technologist and bring them in. So technology acquisition is another. Awesome. The next is competition. So you have a competitor who might be smaller or it might be about the same size. That's giving you awful lot of headaches in the market. So you just go acquire the competition bring them in. Now you meld the two products or maybe you buy the product, buy the company and shut the product down. So you don't want the competition. You just buy it. Whatever it is, there's, there's all of these different reasons why companies buy other companies. And it's, is really important to know. And there are two types of um, acquisitions, right? There's the financial acquisition and there's a strategic acquisition. Financial acquisition is usually a company is looking purely from the financial aspect. What do I get? And this is private equity firms typically do this type of acquisition. But they say, if I buy this company and I do all of these different changes to this company, what can I sell it for? And I make a profit on the spread, right? That's the financial acquisition. A strategic acquisition is where you're buying the company for something that is intrinsic to the company, where you add it to your business and it becomes more more powerful, stronger, whatever. Yeah. Strategic acquisitions tend to pay more money. So if you have a, an opportunity to st sell to a strategic buyer, that's going to give you more of a valuation than if you're buying from buying, uh, selling to a financial buyer. Because a financial buyer wants to buy low and sell high, right? Yeah. So they'll try to beat you down on price. So always a strategic buyer is always better. And there are ways to attract a strategic buyer. How do you position yourself in a way to be attractive to a strategic buyer versus a financial buyer? So there's a lots of things to that. But just broadly to think about, for all business owners to think about, if you're ever thinking of selling your business, think along these lines. What do I have? I mean, take stock uh, of what you have. Do you have technology? Do you have talent? Do you have customers? Do you have territories? Um, all of these things can be valued added to your business. Awesome. Well, cool. Uh, just, just, I really appreciate that. That is some phenomenal information right there and knowledge you just dropped on everybody right there. So if you guys are business owners or want to get into a business or are in the space, uh, maybe listen to this one again and take some notes because this is very powerful stuff. So if someone wants to learn more about how you can help them, um, what are your services? How do you help people? You know, I, um, I work with uh, business owners in three broad areas, right? One is helping them to buy a business. If they're looking to expand their business and want to go buy another one, I'll help uh, identify 
okay, what are the kinds of companies I mean, looking at the businesses themselves, helping you uh, kind of put a value to it uh, that may be realistic and look at strategically how we can add value to your business, right? Uh, the second is how to grow your company and build value, right? How you can get the top dollar for your business before you sell it. At the point when you're ready to sell, it's probably already too late because the things are in place. Yeah. So what you really want to be doing is putting these things in place before you're ready to sell so that you have the processes, you have the systems, you have the people, everything in place to get top dollar, right? So helping grow the business. And the third is helping you sell your business. So what do you need to do to make your business really attractive to prospective buyers? All, we just talked about all the different kinds of uh, reasons why an acquiring company might want to buy your business. So we'll look at all of the different assets that you have and say, okay, this is your best way. So your, your best way is customer acquisition or your best way is technology acquisition, whatever that might be. And we put a full court press on that, get you the top dollar for that. So that's, you know, three different areas in which I help businesses. Awesome. If someone wants to learn more or uh, connect with you, how would they do that? Uh, just simple, dush.ramachandran at gmail.com. That'll do it. And if you guys don't know how to spell that, we'll put it down below or somewhere, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a spelling test right there. There you go. All right, well, once again, Dush, I appreciate uh, this information and thank you for being here. Thank you, Brian. It's always a pleasure. All right, take, take care. care, my friend. Thanks for listening to the Living Legacy Podcast. We'll see you again next time and be sure to click subscribe to get future episodes.